So God has to allow us to realize that we can't do it ourselves. We need yes, Him. Yes, sir. And that yes, is a point that mankind has been driven to. Yes, yes. When we look at the difficulties in the world, I know the world is chaos. It's God's unique way of pointing our minds straight towards Him. Amen. And we can't, and the world is not going to get better unless we come, all humanity come to that point. Because this is the state that we are in. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in, and in this way, death comes to all. We have to come to that understanding that, our, that death because of sin, sin is inevitable. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. Today, if you if you are a student of Zhangzhou, the art of war, we are on debt ground. And, the, and we can't save the army. We only can save ourselves in the process. You can't save your wife, you can't save your children, you can't save Nadine, you can't save Brother Morris, you can't save um KD, Richard, Ella Wright. I can't save I can't save Zaire, I can't save Zachary. I only can save myself. So the big mission. It's to save us. It's to save us from the penalty of sin. We are on that ground, but we have to realize that, that. We have to come to that knowledge. Because what Romans 3 verse 9 says, What shall we conclude then? Do we, do we have any, do we have any advantage? And Romans 3 is a unique text because this is where now we're going to decipher who is really a prodigal son. Romans 3 is this. This question Paul asks, it was asked to the Jews. Because the Jews believe they have an advantage because they, were the, because they are descendant of Abraham. They were given the law, the statues, the temple, the, 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 the prophets, they were giving the Jesus Christ and the oracles. So why wouldn't you believe that you're in a place of privilege? You have God. You have God. So that's why Paul is saying, ask, the, ask this question, is there any advantage in being a Jew? Is there any advantage? Is there any advantage in us being a Christian? Is there any advantage? Is there any advantage? Think about that question. <laughs> Think about that question. Because sometimes, because we are Christians, we believe that we are holy and righteous than those in the world. And just as all the world need Christ, we need him too. And we even need him more because guess what? We are on death's ground. We are in the perfect place of losing our salvation. So we are on that ground. And we can't go back as the Jews do, remembering Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have to remember Jesus Christ, our Savior. Continue in Romans 3. Not at all, not at all Christians, not at all Jews. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understand. There's no one who seeks after God. All have turned away. We have all turned away from God. Not one of us. Not one dege dege one of us. Even us as Christians, you know, if we admit it in our hearts, we too is as when go astray in our hearts. We we pose as Christians. We pose as Christians. Um, Joe, we pose as Christians. But inside our heart, we are straying away from God. But we have to recognize what we are before we can do what we must do. We have to recognize that. And then let's go back to Genesis um, 11. We all went, because of what we have done, we all were, we went away. But we, when we know, when we know the state, 
is when we come to the point of knowing the state we are, what do we do? We seek after the one who can save us Amen. and Amen. justifies us Amen. and reconcile us again Amen. to the harmony of the Father. Because if, if you read Revelation 21, the Father have this yearness. It's like when my dear brother, brother Morris and Ains here and Drew and myself and, 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 and Richard, when we fall in love for the first time, and then our girlfriend leave us for a while. Our mind is crumbled. We can't sleep. We can't sleep at all. We're in torment. We want back our little girlfriend. We if, if we get a call and say that she's between a graveyard in Jamaica, Joe, we don't like to walk through graveyard at night. We don't know about Americans yet. But when it comes to graveyard at night, no. Yeah. But if you love, I heard we have an elder. When he fall in love, he told us in a sermon. He lived in Kingston. And he, the, his girlfriend was in Montego Bay. They didn't have a good bus system at that time. I have no idea how he traveled from that point to get to Montego Bay. Then to get to his girlfriend's yard. There's a grave, <laughs> and it was night. He had no fear, Joe. He walked through the graveyard. Why? He wants to be with his girlfriend. We have to have that same desire and intensity that what we, what we would have feared, we don't fear it anymore because we want God so much. Amen. Amen. We yes, want sir. God so much. Yes, sir. Amen. But we have to come to that point. We have to come to that point. We have to come to that point. Romans 5 verse 6. You see, because when we come to that point, ladies and gentlemen, when we come to that point, then this scripture can be actualized in ourselves, in our hearts. Romans 5 verse 6. You see at just the right time when we were, were, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly we have to come to that point where we recognize that the state that we are in is nothing and we are powerless to do anything we need no Christ to save us from the position of death that we are in so that we can earn or we can achieve eternal life through Christ I went through all of those scriptures to show you that we have to first recognize our state. We have to first look into ourselves and see who we are and decide to make a change. Amen. Because if there's no change, you're just going to go on the same path and God is just going to continue on his own way. Don't believe that God is, God is not like me and you guys here as a father. We see something happen to our child and we jump in immediately. No, he's not. He's going to allow you. And when you cry out to him, then he reach down and snatch you up. So we go back to the parable. Who is a prodigal son? And when and at the end when I'm with you guys, I want you to under, I want you to come to me and say, I I figured it out. Because I'm not gonna give you the secret of who is the prodigal. So I want you to think. So we go back to Luke 15. Luke 15 shows us that we are all sinners before God. That we need to repent so we can have Christ's grace, mercy, and love. And his reconciliation. Therefore, we cannot have the unrepentant heart of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They pray in contempt of sinners. Look into yourself. See if you pray like this. Luke 18, verse 9. To some, To some who are confident, and this is Jesus is talking about um, the Jews who are confident in their righteousness through 
to Abraham. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on, on someone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple pr to pray, a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up by himself and prayed. You know why he stood up by himself? He wants, to, he wants to separate himself from sinners. He wants to show that he is more pious than anybody else. You ever, you ever are at, a, at a church service yet? And when you, you either have prayer, prayer, you have, even have prayer, or you're having prayer, a prayer, prayer, or prayer, or court practice, a choir practice, that is the word, choir practice, prayer or choir practice, or some events in the church, and you see this one person more prominent than everybody else. They're really not doing anything, you know. They just look prominent. The person who's really doing this stuff is the person who will never even make a sound. They are moving the most stone around the place. So if you, so if you realize yourself to be like that, look and think, am I a prodigal son? Am I a prodigal son? Hear how, hear how this Pharisee pray. I thank, I thank you that I am not like other people. So he's saying, you know, he's not a sinner. He's righteous. He don't do anything. Ignoring the text as I've quoted earlier. No one is righteous, not evil one. Not even us in this room. And sometimes I know of persons within church groups that because they feel like they're not commit, they're not stealing, they're not committing fornication, they're not doing adultery, they're more righteous than other people. You have no righteousness. Your righteousness is in Christ. It's imputed righteousness you are living on. It's nothing that you have worked for or gained. It is what it is what Christ did for you. Give you that righteousness. So he boasts, I am not a robber, or an evil doer, an adulterer, or even like that tax collector in this gust and this grace. Not even like that collect tax collector. The Pharisee boasts about his righteousness. He boasts about his achievement in keeping God's law. But who can boast? In the achievement of keeping God's law. Because the law always condemns us. Even if at the minute thing of the law. The law offers no grace. The law offers no grace. You cannot. If you have broke whatever violation that law is. The law is not going to say. Tell me sorry. And I give, forgive you. No. The law is going to execute judgment on you. Only Christ offers you grace. Amen. Only Christ offers you mercy. Only Christ offers you the love of salvation, not the law. So if you boast in keeping the law, yes. and you boast about not being an adulterer, a murderer, a fornicator, a liar, or so on, you're boasting in the wrong thing. You're boasting the wrong way, just like these Pharisees. Who is the prodigal son? Verse 12. I fast twice a week. Yes. Do, do we all know people like that in the church? We Recording fast twice progress. a week. Recording stopped. We fast twice a week. We give a tenth of all. We get. Boast about how we pay tithe to the church. And some of us, some people in the church, boast about how much they give to tithe. They give in tithe, they give to the people in the church. And they, when they pray, they don't want people to pray to them. I tell you now, watch. We as Christians need to watch ourselves more than all the people in the world. Amen. We need to watch ourselves. Who is the real prodigal son? Look at the attitude of a penitent sinner who we should be. Who we should be, who needs Christ. Hear how the, hear how the tax collector pray. But the tax collector stood at distance, not even worthy to come in the presence of God because he believed that where he is is, is holy ground. He cannot come on holy ground. He stood at a distance. 
He stand afar off. He stand afar off. He, 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 he didn't feel worthy to be in the presence of God. He didn't feel worthy. He, 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 he said, let me, let me start again. But the tax collector stood at distant. He would not even look up to heaven. Pity and in shame. But he beats his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. We have to declare who we are to God before God Amen. can look at us. Amen. If we believe we are in our, and we know righteousness, God cannot look at us because God is the only righteous being. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. We must acknowledge that we are sinners and we need repentance and we need to come to him so that he can offer us salvation. Yes, And sometimes as Christians, we judge people in the world too hardly, harshly. When we need to be looking on our own self. We look on the speck in the people's eyes in the world. And we're not seeing the log tree in our own eyes. And we need to, the Bible is written for us. When they come to Christ, yes, but for now, as they, they leave, leave, let God deal with them. Because you know what the scripture says? Rain fall on the just and the unjust. He's not, not because you think you are more righteous. He's going to make more rain fall on you. Thank you, my brother. Who is the prodigal? We have to remember that we are sinners and we need to repent. The parable in Luke 15 is about repentance, reconciliation, grace, mercy, love. From God. It's not nothing whatsoever to do with you. Nothing whatsoever. Not one iota. The prodigal son is not whom we think the prodigal son is. It's just that we have not been looking at ourselves carefully. We have not, we have always looked in the mirror to dress ourselves. Look on the nice tie, the nice shirt. But we have not looked in the mirror to see who we really and truly are. Yes, that man in the mirror. Yes, we have not yet looked at him. Yes, the scriptures and the words of God are there for us to be looking at that man. Yes. To be constantly looking, penetrating on that man. And knowing that man needs repentance. And not because of his privileged position in Christ. He believes that he is better than everybody else. Paul said, I, 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 I glorify in my low position. The Bible is so rich. If we examine it more, we would get so much gems out of it. I turn this. I'm giving it away. I'm not giving it away yet. <laughs> I'm holding it back. Who is the prodigal son? Who is the prodigal son? The unrepentant son. And I gave it away. The unrepentant son is a prodigal son. Who squander the inheritance of God's love. Who squander the inheritance of God's forgiveness. Who squandered away the justification of God. It's not just, yes, it starts about talking, probably start about talking about money and property. But the property, those things will vanish away and decay. But love, the love and righteousness and grace and reconciliation of God will never vanish. So when we spit on those things, we actually spit on God. We spit on God, we squander his, his son, Jesus Christ, who died such a gruesome death so that we can even have anything and any chance of life. It's not his son's, and that sometimes, you know, sometimes I read the Bible and, and I was, I, I, sometimes I wonder if God really sensible because I would think I would not do it. And so that might shock you because I said that. If you read the Old Testament, especially in the book of Nehemiah, God is one of the most patient man I ever seen in my entire being. The, the, 
God go for the for the Israelites. He, he fed them. He gave them manna. Them cry out. He give them meat. Them cry out. He care something like give them like where them have in a Egypt. Still not sat. Them still not satisfied. They still not satisfied. When him do that, him do him do some him carry down fire from heaven. Him carry down clothes for protect them. Still not satisfied. As soon as God turned him back a little bit, as they thought, they went astray from God. And them have the audacity. When problems hit them, they go, oh, Jesus, God, help me, help me. And God looked down upon them and said, Jesus Christ, because of God, because of Isaac, Abraham, and that's I just that's, you know. It's just the covenant to make with Abraham and Isaac can save you, you know. I just that's it. You ever, you ever when every time when God when they rebel and I come back to God, God remembers so God, God say, Why you say if I never eat like we don't you say like we don't say, You say if I never you say if I never your father out and beat You say if I just throw your father, you know. The God I say it's just because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why I'm doing it. Not, it's not something I want to do naturally out of myself. It's just that I made a covenant with them, and I just have to keep that covenant. And God bless them again, and they are eating, drinking, and so on. Again, them turn off. If I was God, I'm not going back four, five, six times. <laughs> but thank God I am not God. I thank God. Thank God I am not God. Thank God, God. I thank God I am not God. God. Hallelujah. Thank God I am not God because thank God. I do have the patience that he has. I, I have to be truthful. I don't have the patience, but thank God for God. Yes, sir. Amen. May I tell you, because why we right, with him. Oh, God. Oh, God. Thank God for God. Amen. Thank God for God. Thank God for your mercy, man. Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued from the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin. And, and started to say, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of my, the estate. So he divided the property between them. The father did not even think twice. You want your property? Here it is. Do whatever you feel with it. I am because you see the thing is that God, when God makes a promise to you, is not going to change his mind. He said it is yours. Yes, sir. Amen. It is yours. Anytime you want it, you are gonna get it. Not because I believe you don't deserve it right now, but because it is yours. I'm giving it to you. So whenever time we are in this faith and we decide that we want our, in, in our, in, our inheritance of grace and love, we can always go through the door with it. But one of the things I must remind us that we are on that ground. And if you don't come back, if you don't come back within the time of your grace period, you're gone. I, I am sorry about that, but I can't do anything. I can't do anything about it. We have to we have to love God as much as our God loves us. We have to love God as much as He wants. Because it's not see, and I always say that sometimes I can't understand it, but my mind should not understand God. My mind should not understand God. God can understand him in his own mind. I can't understand God's mind. Because if it's up to me, I would not give him anything. One, I'm not dead yet. So you're coming to talk about your you want your estate for. You're coming to tell me you want half, you want your inheritance. No. I'm not even dead yet. I'm not even arranged where my funeral plot is and you telling me you want half of the estate. I would never give him a thing. But God, who is merciful, said, take your thing and go. You will see what will happen. You will see. As it continue, not long after that, the young man, happy with his money, cash out. 
Like Bitcoin. Yes, sir. Cash out in Bitcoin. Yes, sir. Not long after that, the young man, young man, the young, the young son got together all he had. Set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Girls, party, everything. It's like him there, Las Vegas. It's a Las Vegas he gone. Everything that he wants, he's getting. Continue verse 40. After spending everything, the, you, hear, hear what happened now. After he spent everything, you know, because he could spend everything, and then say, so, oh, I am broke. I can now go back and work and then reinvest and make back my wealth. Well, God said, all right. That's all you thinking. Hear what is going to happen? No. Famine in the land. I'm going to make things difficult for you. So when you continue in the verse, you continue in the verse, there was a famine in the land. So when he, so he went, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen. To feed pigs you're gone to the worst because we know that as a Jew you don't you don't even associate with a pork you don't even associate the, the other day you know at the other day I was in the supermarket and and the one the shelf where the meat is it's lined off with pork and the and the and the beef and the soy is just on little spot they give it I wonder why they always do that a little spot then give the, the yes. beef the, and the little, little meat that you can eat. But the shelf is filled with, 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 with pork. One time I, I went into the store. I like to eat liver. Right? So I look for, and I'm going to look for beef liver. Right? So I saw the liver and I grabbed it and I threw it in my, in, in my, in my bag, in my tray. When I got home, or that looks and look at it and said, Sala, you don't see his pork liver, you buy. I said, What? <laughs> Chew it out. <laughs> I didn't notice. It filled the place. So sometimes when we go, we go off, we, we, it was among the pigs, feeding the pigs. It's an awful feeling. Yeah. But you see, the thing is that when you come to that point, just as how I realized that what is happening, I said, toss it out. I come to my senses because uh, some people that say, but I don't spend the money already. I'm just eat it. Now, who is no? Yeah, nobody not going to know <laughs> anyway. This is something we know. And don't even tell the children them either. Just eat. Just we just eat it. Nobody not for this. It's just between you and me, baby. <laughs> But it's not only between me and me, it's between you and between us and God. Yes, yes, Toss it out. So the young man came to his senses in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many, how many of my father's hired servants have good food to eat? He now started to reminisce on the food that he used to have and the lifestyle he used to live. And I and I'm I'm and I'm here. Starving to death. Sometimes we have to come. God have to bring us to that point of starvation for us to want to go back and reach out for God. So sometimes when we go off, the difficulties what we have is because of the, the distance we are stepping away from God. And God is sending you some signs for you to come back. To spin your role and come back. Sometimes some of us is still so disobedient. We believe that we can make it. We believe that we can turn things around. When God makes things difficult, you cannot turn it around. Only Him can turn that yes, around. Sir. Amen to that. Amen. Only Him can turn it around. Yes, sir. Verse 18, I will sit out. I will set out back. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, you see, the other thing is that, is courage. A lot of us don't play courage. A lot of us don't play courage. But courage, you, we don't play courage. Courage has a lot to do with faith. Because when you have left the church, say you were in a prominent, all of us in the church here are in a prominent position in the church, and we leave the church for a while. 
We leave the church for a while and we want to come back. It's difficult for us to come back. It's hard to come back. We're worrying about how people will see what the people will say about us. How when the pastor preach, he's gonna preach about me. Word that exactly word showing. And the friends that I have don't want to associate themselves with me. You feel so guilty and burdened that that burden and just keep you away from God. But when you are feeling that, that is the time you need to push towards God, not away from him. Because the closer you get to him, is the better things will become. In our country, Joe, we are, as I tell you before, we are afraid of ghosts. We call them doppy. I live in a and I live in a country part of Jamaica. You don't have street light like how we have street light on every post here or so. From here to go to Massachusetts and New York and all. We don't have light like that. I had one light like um, a mile away from my yard, and then the other light was somebody put a light bulb on a stick. <laughs> my yard was like down a slope. I was coming home late in the night. I think I was coming from Bible study or something in the night, late. And I saw a shadow on a post like this. I swear, my head swell. <laughs> cool sweat. I watch. The man is right at my gate. I need to go home. I can't sleep on the road. I need to go home. And I said, I said to myself, I have to go home. I can't let you make me, I can't allow you to make me sleep on the street. I have to go home. The bed is, I have to go home. And I muster courage. The closer I go, the fatter my head swell. My body was washing with sweat, Joe. My, everything. You know when you move, but you feel like you're not moving, there's no life. But I said, I have to go on. I have nowhere else to go. And behind me is dark. I have to go to my yard. And I walk and I walk. And the more I walk, I, I feel more courage. I feel more strength. When I reach to my gate, it's the little brother who live over the other side. Of the <laughs> it's a neighbor. <laughs> My mind tell me it was a ghost. I believed. <laughs> but I said, when I went down there and saw him, and I said, brother, I said, boss, what a thing that you're doing. You could have killed me. Because I could have almost died. But it's when you feel that way, you need to press on to God. Because what you fear is not really the reality. Sometimes we fear something, we fear so much yes, that we never step out. Yes, sir. The fear is greater. We have to step out sometimes and to overcome that fear. Courage is the ability to do something that is frightening for one. Just frightening. Because that night was frightening for me. But I, I, and you know, when I went through that night, anytime again I see something like that, I have no hesitation. Yes, if it is a ghost or not, my mind is made up. Yes, I am going down. I am going home. And I'm not going home with the, the fear that I had before. I'm not going home with that. So in faith, we have to have courage. We have to have courage to build that faith. And this is what the prodigal, this, this, the son did. His father, <coughs> continuing the story. This is what we, that, this is what he is going to stand. This is what his father says to his, this is what he is going to say to his father. Okay, I think I should read that. All right, forget that. Father, so, oh, this is what I'm saying. He made up in his mind what he's going to say to his father. So you think about it, right? Because that is the first starting point. You have to think about it. And then thinking about it, you move into action. 
So he thought about it. He planned it out. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Yes, you have. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. We have to come to that point. We have to, it's, a, it's God is driven us, driven, driven us to come to that point. We are not worthy so that we can seek after Christ. Light after Christ. Make me one of your hired servants. Yes, he built the courage to go back. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still at, while he was a long way off, his father saw him. Sometimes when we, sometimes as young people, we don't know the stress we cause our parents when we leave and don't tell them where we are going, you know. And they can't call us. They, they're trying to call us on our phone and we, they're not hearing an answer. It terrifies them. You can imagine for the years this son have gone, how it terrifies the father. He probably sit on his porch every day looking out. And suddenly, subsequently, one of the days that he was looking out, he saw him. Just like us as parents. When we, when we can't get our child, child on the phone and we finally got them, that peace that, that, passes, that passes all understanding just fill us. Now we know where you are. Yes, sir. All right, we're just Amen. waiting for you to come Amen. home to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to solve that first. <laughs> but look at what he said. The father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. Yes. I think about it. Just imagine yourself. You have done wrong, you know. And you see your father running towards you. That again terrifies you. you know? What is happening? What is he doing? What is going, what is going to do with me? But the fear is not the reality. The father threw his arms around him and yes, kissed him. Yes, he kissed yes, him. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. How much God is waiting to throw his arms around us. Throw his arms around him and kissed him and kissed him. My son, he said, my, so, my son. The son said, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. Shut up, I do not want to hear it. I am, not wor I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Who tell you that? Fear is the greatest barrier to our success. Fear is the greatest barrier to our success. Because sometimes what we fear is not what really is the reality of the matter. It's just we overemphasize our fear that we never move. And we, we have to move. I remember this friend in church. She went away from the faith for a while. She did some things that she shouldn't have done. She came back and she, was, she had a hard time fitting in. She came to me because at the time I was, at, well, I was, the youth, I was a part of the youth ministry, the youth president, um, the, the, the public relations speaker. They give me a public relations speaker, you know, so. So I was part of, in that category, but I was one of, like, one of their big brothers in the, in the church. So she came to me and said, Solomon, I don't feel that I belong. I don't feel people are saying things about me and all of this. And I said, look, the only way you can overcome that is serve the church. After you serve the church, they will forget. She she quickly moved into action, start to serve, carrying the drink, giving somebody water, helping out with decoration. After a while, people forgot what she did. She started to get comfortable, and people started to give her more things to do. She's still in the church today. When you go away and come back, find something to do. Find something to do. You can, yeah, you can go for a while living for a time, but when you come back, if you don't find something to do, you are going to leave again. Because I've seen persons who went away, came back, find nothing to do and leave again and never come back. If you muster the courage to come back the first time, find something to do. The Bible scripture says, faith without works is dead. 
If you come back and not doing and exercising that faith into action, you're just killing yourself again. You're just putting yourself on the slaughter stakes. But remember this saying, fear is, fear is the barrier. Fear is the greatest barrier to our success. Remember that. And you can apply this in every part of your life. Every area of your life. Everywhere. Fear is a barrier towards success. We have to overcome fear. But the father said to his servant, quickly, bring up the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. What the father is actually doing is giving him back the position that he thought he lost. Is giving him back everything yes. that he thought in his mind that he doesn't have. God, God is waiting always to give us everything. What we are, what we are waiting for, you know, it's like the, as the scripture said, we are waiting to be like Christ. Whatever that is, we can all make up our mind what it is in the scriptures. But whatever Christ is, is what God is saying you are going to get. So the we, don't have, we have lost our status from the Garden of Eden. We have lost our status from Genesis 11. But at the end of our life, if we are faithful, he will restore everything. We say in Jamaica, every striking thing. Yes, sir. He give us back everything. Amen. That's what that means. Everything. So when we think we have lost everything, in Christ we have gained everything. We have gained everything. Put on our sandals on his feet. Bring a fat calf. Kill it. And let us celebrate and have a feast. My lost son has returned. God is waiting on all of us who are a prodigal son. But we have to know what we are before we can. That reconciliation process can work. We have to know our state. We have to know our state. But my question still is, who is the prodigal son? Let us move on because, <clears throat> let us go down. Look at this scripture in Luke 15 verse 7. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven for one sinner to come to repentance than the 99 that remain. Go back to the beginning of the parable. The 99 believe that they are righteous. The one that he went for realized that he's a sinner. That's why he leave the 99 righteous. Because he needs to deal with the sick. Not those who don't have sickness. Doctors don't go to place. Because you have a doctor set up. A, a, a medical lab, a medical facility in an area where nobody has sickness. He will dead broke. He will die, a, die as we said, die a pauper. Doctors would set up a mechanic, a lawyer, whatever profession. You'd set up in an area where you can make a, make a living. <clears throat> God leave the 99 righteous and seek after the one sinner. But well, you notice how much he leave 99 for just one single one. Because the one single one realizes what he is and where he are and who he needs. And the power go on to say, the father puts him on his shoulder and went back and have a big banquet. Completing what you have in the prodigal son. The same thing of the 99 is the same thing the father did to the son. Who is the prodigal son? But look on something I want you to look at. Is the attitude of the older brother. Look at the attitude of the older brother. It starts on verse 27. Look at the attitude. <clears throat> look at the attitude of the younger, older brother. Your brother has come back, he replied. And you might notice I have jumped ahead. So you will have to read the thing for yourself. 
Your brother has come back, he replied. It was a servant talking to the bigger brother because the bigger brother wanted to know what was happening. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has, because he has come back safely, safe and sound. Yes, sir. When we leave God at any time, we could have died without salvation and grace and his love. It's a risk we take when we leave the presence of God. It's a big risk, risk uncalculated. Because at any given moment, you could have died outside of God's love and God's grace. And sometimes, and that's why I, I feel so much for those who are in the faith and left. Because at any moment, the love of God can expire on them. They live as the li <coughs> The life that they have gotten is the amount of grace that they have earned while they was with God. And what they are doing, they are winding it out until there is no more. When there is no more, that's it. Who can you blame? Can't blame anybody for that. You can't even blame God for that either. Can't even blame God for that. <clears throat> can't even blame God for that. If safe and sound. When he when when we leave oh, when we leave God's love and mercy and grace and reconcilia reconciliation, we have separated ourselves from God. See all God wants to do with us is just have us enough. It's just have us. I want like your husbands, I want to have you to myself, baby. Let not the children get in the way. Tonight is our night when we are passionate in love. That's all God wants to have that loving relationship with us. Verse 25. While the older son was in the field, when he came, when he came near in the house, he heard music and dancing. The older brother came back. The older brother became angry, refused to go in. Envy, malice, strive, everything you have spoken about earlier in, 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 the, in the Passover. This guy was so filled with anger. You know, let me just read on. on. <coughs> read with him. Let me just read it over to you. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and, and pleaded with him. But he, he answered his father, Look, look, all these years I have been serving, slaving for you, and never disobeyed your orders. When have you not disobeyed me? Yet you never give me a young goat so I could, could, I, so I could celebrate with my friends. That's a blatant lie. Because we who grew up, I grew up on a small farm where my father had chickens. And I, when, when I want and my friends, I just, cut, I just take a chicken and just eat it with my friends, run a boat. So this cannot be true. He's a liar. He's saying, he's saying that his father is ungrateful. His father is a wicked. This person who you because prostitute himself. You give him more, you give him everything back. And, you, and, and me. You know, is 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 guess what? When the bigger brother saw that the younger brother got back the same amount of wealth that he had, that was what made him angry, you know. And if we look on the parable with the, with the, with, with with those um who God went out to hire. A man come in at the beginning of the day. And at the end of the day, somebody come in and get the same amount of money. What did they do? The one who were there for a morning. Grumble. And say, how can you do? And God have to say, boss, it's my property, my land. I pay you. We made a deal. We made a bargain. So what if you start before them? It's my choice. You can't tell me how to spend my money. And some of us, we believe that we can tell God what to do. We have no right to tell what to go, God to do. God do run his own business and run his own show. 
this young man was envious of his, of his brother because his, his, quand, his younger brother squandered his wealth and now he has received an equal wealth to his brother. So he envied his brother for that. And when we go to 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, get rid of the old E so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore let us keep the festival. The emphasis is Christ, not you, not us. Christ is the emphasis. Christ is the emphasis of our life. Do not <clears throat> unleaven bread of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Many of us who are Christians, and I'm talking to us as Christians because guess what? As this will go out on the wider TV population, many of us Christians don't believe that. We, we believe that the world need God more than all we need God. We believe that we are more righteous than the world. We believe that we are more righteous. That we can't fellowship with some of our brothers because we have different concepts and ideas and beliefs. And I must tell you, in our faith, one of our um, faith, um, Joe, same set of doctrine, same set of belief. And I don't know why church people stay so. Sorry for saying that. I don't know why church people are like that. I am not, I am CGI. You are um, um, Seventh-day um, Baptist and so on. We don't want to fellowship with each other because what? we are Seventh-day Baptists and we are Jehovah's Witnesses. See, you see, I and I, man, all when Adventists have social, I'm there. I'm socialized because Jesus socialized with everybody. So why am I not socializing with you? Because I'm in a different faith than you are. We're all God people. We're all lost at one time. Through Christ, we have come back to grace. Through Christ, we have received his love. Through Christ, we have received rec reconciliation. Through Christ, we have received justification. I did nothing. But I can do one thing. Be your friend. G there's, a, there's, a saying, there's a part in the Bible that says, a man, Jesus came to a man and, and Jesus was real enough to say, you feed me, you close me, and you this and you that. And the, the guy said, when did I do that? Whenever you're doing it for those people, you're doing it for me. Sometimes we miss those little things, those little nuances in the scripture. We just miss them. We just miss them. And we concentrate so much on the weightier part of the law and not think about the simple little things that we ought to do. Love thy neighbors thyself. Amen. Wash your brother's feet. Find food to, to give him. I remember one time, you know, I was, I was younger in the, in the youth choir. <laughs> this, in, in, in America they call, what we call a person who lose their mind in America? What's the medical term? Lose their mind, they get mad. We say mad in Jamaica. No, no. Uh, dementia? All that. So when you lose your mind and you become a mad person, you're walking on the street. Dementia. Well, in a, well we, we, we Jamaican just simplify it. We just say they're mad. They lose their mind. They're a mad man, mad woman. Right? Our home, what our homeless. I remember this time, probably she was she was losing her mind or she was she was homeless. Or in, whatever the term, the medical term is. But I remember this lady. She was dirty. She was, she was in ragged clothes. She had a bag in her hand. And I, a lot of us were in the youth choir. I think the youth choir was like probably around 20 odd going 30. Big youth choir. Very vibrant in the church. When the church, when we do a song and the church clap, we all come off the stage and they are still clapping till we got a seat. That's how good we were. We we're puffed up. We we're and we and we normally look at the senior choir and say, Chia, not now. <laughs> well, you know, we never <laughs> senior no go never hot. And we used to tell them still. <laughs> but we were all puffed up as little children. And I remember when we were practicing um one Sabbath after service. And I saw this lady coming towards us. She was dirty, homeless, obviously. 
and I saw her coming to me and you know I leave because I saw the I saw the, the, the my fellow choir members the fear they were terrified of this woman she was she was serious she was coming over to us they were terrified I could see the fear in their eyes and I look at the lady the lady look hungry <clears throat> and you know I I don't know what urge into me I, I I moved from the circle of choir and I went out and meet her and is the only thing I could do first is just give her a hug when I hugged her, she started crying, and she said, I'm hungry, can you help me? And I gave her what I had. And then we talked for a little while, and she went. You see, the thing is that every day I wonder what happened to this lady. But someday I will find it out. But that was an experience. Sometimes we look on people and the condition that they are, and God never look on the condition that we are in. Keep on looking at how people look. But God don't look at that. He has never looked at it. You know why? Because it's, he has always seen Jesus Christ's righteousness on us. He always seen God's blood overflowing over, Christ's blood flow, overflowing over, over us. See, what God did, no man will ever do. Paul said it. No man, a man will merely die for a friend. <laughs> Much less, God died for a complete stranger. One that he did not have to die. And I said to some people, I said, Christ is the only man who knows that he was going to die from eternity till he came on earth. You can imagine from, ever, from before time, you know how you are going to die. And you know who is going to kill you. And then when you come on the earth for 30, for, three, for, for 33 and a half years, you know how your death will be up until the last moment. You know, terrifying that to, to some of us. And that's why when God, Jesus in the Garden of Eden, Jesus said, take this cup, no, but not my will, but thy will. He, he, God, Jesus understand the thing. But because he loved us so much, he extend himself to die for us. Yes, Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. Amen. Thy will be done. We have to see who we are so that we can come to repentance and get forgiveness. We have to purge out that selfish person in us to let the light of Christ shine from within us. We cannot squander our property and our inheritance of grace, of, of God's love, of God's mercy, of his forgiveness. If we want to walk with Christ, if we believe that this part is it, this is the time we have to make up our mind. What are we going to be? The prodigal son who squander God's inheritance? Or are we going to be the repentive son who come back to Christ?